Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful and thankful for the access that we have to approach you and to approach your word with absolute confidence that you know what's best for us, that you are our teacher, that you guide us, you strengthen us, you uphold us by your grace, your mercy, and your love. I just want to ask that you would filter out all of that which is not of you, all of that which is foolish, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Uh, I'm going to be recording inside today because it's probably something like 200 degrees below zero outside here in southeast Oklahoma. So, uh, of course, uh, you know, it's, uh, I guess it's not a very good idea to lie to you right from the start, but I felt the need to exaggerate. Happy New Year, folks. Welcome to 2022. Uh, our Lord is in control. He knows all things. And we are going forward, moving ever more rapidly, I believe, toward the day of the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We've been studying together in the first epistle of John and in our last study together. We looked at the fact in verse 11 that here is a recorded record that God gave us eternal life. Therefore, since it's impossible for God to lie, every Arminian basically is calling God a liar. And folks, that's a terrible charge, but that's what God said. If God had said that he gave me a year of life and I only lived six months, then he lied. You know, I didn't get a year. But he didn't say that. He didn't do that. He gave me eternal life. And if it's possible to lose eternal life, well, that means it couldn't have been eternal to begin with. So we don't make God a liar. We're saying that he spoke the truth and that that was his record. And then we find that we have great confidence. We have absolute confidence in Christ that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us highlight according to his will. And so again, either that's true or it isn't. And God can't lie. Verse 12, he that has the son hath the life and he that hath not the Son of God hath not the life. We've seen this contrasted back and forth uh, from the very beginning of the epistle. We're looking at those who are his as compared to those who are not. So and that's, the con that's been the general overall context. So it seems that the definite article is contrasting spiritual life with spiritual death. And I think that the reason that the Holy Spirit gave us this literally epic epistle was to enhance the record that God has given to us, each one of us, especially through John, and that is that we have eternal life. This was written so that you might know that you have eternal life and believe on the name of the Son of God, you know, and note the fact that we already believe uh, we've talked a lot about the, rever the right order of things, not reversing these things. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know. And that's a perfect, uh, that's perfect knowledge. That's oida. You may know, perfectly know, that you have eternal life. And I don't know how many people don't think they have eternal life, those who profess to know the Lord. And I wonder why. Well, there's, I suppose there are many reasons why they don't know, but we're going to talk about one. I think we're going to be looking at a verse here soon that's going to give us some insight into that. That you may know, perfectly know, that you have eternal life. Tremendous passages of Scripture where unintentionally God's people are calling Him a liar day after day. Are you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. If you're not, then this book isn't true. Is God working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure, or is he not? I mean, if he isn't, this well, then this book's not true. When he's tested you, will you come forth as gold? If you don't, dearly beloved, if you don't, this book ain't true. 
And it, it simply says that he gave you eternal life. It's not a complicated statement. And if he did not, then he's a liar. There's a lot of no's here in the text as we close out this, this amazing epistle here in chapter 5. There's a lot of no's. You'll, you can highlight those, underline them or something, or at least just take note of them. There's a lot of no's here. We're going to look at those. With all the no's that we read here in the text, it seems that we're closing out the book knowing some things or the Holy Spirit wants us to know some things. We absolutely know, perfect tense, that God hears us. And whatsoever we ask in His name, we know that we have the petitions that we've desired of Him. And now we come to the 16th verse. And folks, there's many interpretations of this verse. And I'm not saying I, I know the right one. I'm simply going to go through this as a student of God's word, and it's up to you to decide, you know, what you, what you believe about this verse. I could list at least, at least five or six, perhaps even ten different uh, approaches to this verse. When I look at the most popular one, normally taught in, in most seminaries and by most ministers, the assumptions sort of begin like this. That verse 16 begins a new subject. That there's a break between the previous verse, verse 15 and verse 16. That's, that's first of all. Secondly, the death that's involved here is physical death. And the life that's in this verse is physical life. That's the, the second assumption. And the third assumption is that uh, there are sins that you practice that don't lead to physical death. However, there are some sins where God obviously, uh, you know, reacts uh, in in a way in which you uh, you die a physical death. And almost every minister then goes, to, you know, to things like well, Nahab or Ananias or or Sapphira or uh, who was it that uh, tried to uh, Uzzah, who tried to help God in in keeping the ark upright uh, they'll go to those verses and they use those passages of scripture to indicate that there are occasions where God takes his people because they stubbornly insist in or they continue in sin so basically God what happens is God just says well I've had enough and so he takes these believers home to be with him they die a physical death the sin unto death and folks I used to believe that uh, it just sounded so wonderful, you know. I even had a pastor one time tell me, well, if the Lord can't have fellowship with you here, he'll take you home and he'll have fellowship with you there. And I thought, oh, isn't that wonderful? Look at the grace in that. And I don't believe, I no longer believe that. I no longer believe that. I'm going to offer another possibility here for your consideration. You can think about it, pray about it, study through it, uh, reach your own conclusions. But, uh, you know, they talk about that, uh, the, the sin unto death. That's a, that's, a, uh, that's a different kind of sin. That's the second part of the verse. You know, well, what that means is, that, well, you murdered somebody, they arrested you, you went to trial, you was convicted, condemned to death in the electric chair. You know, or the gas chamber, or, or I don't, you know, the gallows. You know, they hung you, you know, from the neck until dead, or, or, or whatever the case may be. So we shouldn't pray for that. You know, you know, Christians going to heaven, but we shouldn't want that. Well, or actually, it's the reverse. What the what the common idea thought there is is that. Uh, you know they're not going to heaven so you know we wouldn't we don't we're not to pray for that well first of all i'm gonna i'm just gonna tell you i think and big red flag you know you look you all know that i'm about as radical as i can probably or possibly be when it comes to some of these verses that i don't really follow the norm i don't follow i don't really fit into the majority. My opinion often goes contrary to the majority opinion. 
and I caution you about that, but I got to I can only tell you what I think the text says. Okay. So first of all, I think that the one seeing his brother sinning, a sin not unto death, is the one that God gives life to, not the one that it's that is sinning not unto death. I'll just put that lay that right out here right from the very start. The one that's that's seeing his brother sin already has eternal life. The one that he his brother that he's seeing sin a sin not unto death already has eternal life. But the one that is doing the seeing and and quite possibly the judging as to whether or not this brother this person's a brother in the Lord or not, God is giving that person that is seeing life zoe the quality of life because he needs some understanding concerning what he's seeing in his brother's life if that makes sense at all i that's that's kind of the way i'm looking at that the word zoe life the quality of life that's not eternal life he, he he already has that in fact the word eternal doesn't even appear in the text it's just life because the one seeing doing the seeing here doesn't realize that both himself and his brother that he's seeing a sin sin he's seeing his brother's sin a sin uh, not unto death not under it's not going to put him in hell uh, that they he comes to a realization that they both have a new man that cannot sin listen to me distinctly separate from the old man which we were shown in chapter 3, which has been contrasted, think context, folks. Context, 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 okay? Context, is, I believe, is going to tell us what's going on in verse 16. And by being given this life, this, this realization, this perception, he shall give him life for them, now it's plural, that sin not unto death. So there's, 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 there's more than one person here that's sinning not unto death. It changes to plural, meaning that, and this is what I believe, that in the future, every time he sees a brother sinning not unto death, his perception of the brethren, not just this one brother, but all, all brethren, will no longer be the same. The focus won't be on sin, but on the Savior. And why should it... Why should it be on sin, given what we've seen in the context, folks? The amazing revelation that we have been given all throughout this context concerning the sin problem. Now, the problem that I have with Ananias or Uzzah or others like that is they don't look like people who are continually persisting in a sin like so many commentators would, would talk about, you know, uh, where eventually God took them home, okay? So the scriptures really don't fit, and I'm simply going to try and tell you folks what I think this means. And then it's up to you to search the scriptures and decide where to go with these verses, but I, all I can do is tell you what, I, what I'm seeing in the text. And then it's up to you to decide. So first of all, I do not believe that there's any break between 16, verse 16, and that which preceded, verse 15. Uh, where we were asking God according to His will. So I don't believe there's any break there. Secondly, I'm absolutely persuaded it cannot be physical death and physical life being referred to in verse 16. That it is spiritual death and spiritual life, not only here in this verse, but in this whole entire epistle. Uh, if any man sees, the word is an aorist, it isn't that he constantly sees this individual. There isn't any indication in the text that somebody is persisting in some kind of, of sin that's, that's continuing to go on. He sees his brother, he's got to see it, he didn't, he didn't hear it on Facebook, you know, or social media, he saw it. He sees his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, that is, not unto spiritual death. 
And folks, every single one of you listening to me today sins not unto death. Every one of you. Every one of you. When we get to verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God doesn't sin. Does that ring a bell? You know, chapter 3, his seed abides in you. The new man, it cannot sin because it's been born of God. God does not begat children who are sinners. Okay? When we get to verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God doesn't sin. So we can't say the brother in verse 16 is not born of God. We can't do that. Yet, I think that's often done. Okay? Unfortunately. Here is somebody seeing his brother committing a sin, which is not a sin that indicates spiritual death. Doesn't lead to, it's not toward spiritual death. The word there is, is pros, meaning toward. It's not toward spiritual death. He sees a brother. Now, I think most ministers would say that you can't really take the word brother there to mean brother. It's, it's one who thinks he's a brother, and that seems to kind of, you know, remove a lot of burdens. But, the, folks, the verse doesn't say that. To me, it says he sees his brother sin a sin, which is not toward spiritual death. And when he does that, when he does that, he, the one that sees the sin, shall ask. He shall ask. Okay? And we have all of these he's. He shall ask and he shall give him. You know, and folks, you gotta, now you got to deal with all those pronouns. And the translators, they go crazy with that. So let me take the position that I don't, I don't know any theology at all. I'm just reading the Greek. And my Greek says that the guy who sees this, this guy do this asks God, and God gives, listen, God gives the guy that asks life. doesn't say that God gives life to the guy sinning a sin not unto death. It says God gives life to the guy asking. If you go to something like, well, the Net Bible, you know, they translate it, that he gives life for the one who's sinning, you know, you know. Dearly beloved, we need, I believe, some spiritual understanding when we deal with our brethren. We, we're all in this body of death. Oh, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. If it were possible for any one of you or for me, to look into any one of your lives, the only conclusion that, that we would probably reach is that, well, we're all just going to hell. No Christian would live the way that, you know, you live in your thinking and your behavior and your theology. And folks, we just shrug those things off. You know, we break the speed limit. We don't even think about it. You know, we wouldn't, of course, we wouldn't cheat on our wife or our income tax, but we do the best we can, you know, to keep those taxes low and all this stuff that, you know, that is so filthy. Folks, we have a body of death. We have this treasure in an earthy vessel, earthen vessel. And I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to understand that the things that you would not, these I do, and that which I would, I do not. That's Romans 7, chapter 7. But if I ask God, I suddenly see that it's not me. It's sin that dwells in me. And that's where we're, in, we're that's actually where we're going to go in the 18th verse. Okay? Not me, it's sin that dwells in me. We know that whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Now there's a verse of scripture that says that we should speak the truth in love. And we're all familiar with that verse. Yet there's, there's so much fighting going on among God's people. But I can love you dearly no matter what, because I know that whatsoever is born of God sinneth not. We're looking at, the, God is showing us, pointing us to, to recognize the reality of the sinless new man who cannot sin. 
So what is the guy asking? Is, is the text saying that he's asking God to intervene in that brother's life that he sees that is sinning a sin not unto death? Or, or asking God to understand what's, what's going on? Or God gives him an understanding of what's going on? He gives him an understanding of eternal life. He gives him an understanding of that new man, that new creation that was created in righteousness and true holiness. You're not going to lose that eternal life. If you lose that eternal life, God's lost everything, folks. If you lose it, if you lose it, well, no sweat. You ought to go to hell anyway. That's where you belong. God loses everything, folks. He loses his righteousness. He loses his justice because Christ died in your place. He loses his integrity. He loses his honesty. God cannot put you in hell if Jesus Christ died in your place because that life is eternal. Life can't be anything else. I believe the text is a strong urging to pray for our brethren and to understand that we have this treasure in earthen vessels that, that, so that the excellency, excellency of the power may be of God and not of ourselves and that the old man does nothing but sin. That's all it does. That portion of you which is born of God cannot sin. It doesn't have the ability to sin because God's seed remains in you. That can't happen. I recognize that. Oh, but uh, oh, but Steve, what that says is is that a, a good tree doesn't bring forth good fruit all the time. It does. Well, it doesn't say that. And I've talked about the good tree, bad tree before. You're going to tell me that that portion of you, which is a new creation in Christ, which is the new man, which was created in righteousness and true holiness, it sins some of the time, but, 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 but he doesn't habitually sin. I think it's because we have said that, that we have multitudes that going out saying, boy, I habitually sin, so maybe I'm not saved. Maybe I'm not redeemed. Maybe I'm not justified. Maybe Jesus Christ didn't die for me. And so we load God's people up with guilt. The, a weight of guilt that God never intended nor equipped that we bear. I believe the verse is a verse of comfort, of confidence. This is the confidence that we have in Him. I reached the conclusion that we, we as believers in Christ, have good reason to distinguish between sins that are toward death and sins that are not toward death. You know, it certainly implies that there is a scene of spiritual death, okay, here, but that is not in relationship to the brother. I don't believe that the brother is, is, is in the last half of the verse. There are sins that do not lead to spiritual death. Why? Because he's a brother. There is a sin that leads toward death. You know, and you know that. I believe the text says that you know that. And... I believe the text says, I do not say that you should pray for that. And the word pray there means investigate. I do not believe you should investigate this. But as far as my brother in the Lord, as far as he's concerned, I have to take this to the Lord and I have to say, now, is that guy a brother in the Lord or is he not? And as I pray about it, my text is saying that as I pray about it, God is telling me that that's a brother in Christ. That's the prayer he shall ask. Ask what? Ask that the Lord forgive that sin? Well, that doesn't make any sense. He's already done that. So the way I see my brother living, is he really a brother in the Lord? I'll pray about this, and the Lord's going to answer my prayer and say, yes, he's a brother in the Lord. That's what the text says to me, folks. Okay? And I'm just, so I'm just reading it the way I'm reading it. That's what it says to me. 
not giving my brother eternal life. He already has eternal life, but life to me, to me. And don't, don't make the mistake of thinking because you have eternal life that you don't need life. Okay? We all need life. Jesus came that we ha may have life and that more abundantly. Okay? Those who already have eternal life need life and life more abundantly. The word eternal is nowhere in the text there. Uh, and the word pray there means investigate. I do not believe you should investigate this. But as far as my brother is concerned, i got to take this to the Lord and say, now, you know, is that, is that brother, is that brother of mine, is he truly a brother or is he not? And as I pray about it, my text is saying that, that, that as I pray about it, God's telling me that that's a brother in Christ. That's the prayer he shall ask. So, uh, so we already has eternal life, but, but life to me, the one seeing and the one asking, you know, that's, you know, who would never cheer for OSU. Now I see my brother over here and he's cheering for OSU. I, you know, I'm cheering for OU. He's cheering for OSU. That guy can't be going to heaven. Nobody cheering for OSU is going to heaven. So I got to pray about that. And the Lord isn't doing anything for my brother. I don't believe it says that the Lord is doing anything for this brother sinning a sin not unto death. Doesn't say anything about that. The Lord's going to say to me, Steve, don't be so judgmental. He's a brother or a sister in this case. A brother or a sister in the Lord. He's going to answer that prayer. I think that's what the answer to my prayer is. I mean, think prodigal son here, folks. Okay? I take it as spiritual death, not physical death in the second part of the verse as well as the first part of the verse however death in the scriptures the you know the wages of sin is death i don't think that death there is uh spiritual death romans chapter 8 if you live after the flesh you shall die a spiritual death i don't think that, that that's what that says i don't think that death is spiritual death the word death folks means the very word means separation. Separation from God or separation from something. But separation from God can be temporary or it can be eternal. This, my son, he, you know, said the father, he's, a, he's, my, he's my son. He was always my son. He was dead and is alive again. He was lost to his father, but he was always a son. And folks, it is so, so easy, so easy to judge other Christians. You know, for, for brothers overtaken in a fault, we ought to restore them. You know, not write articles about him, not talk about bad about him on Facebook or Twitter or, any, or whatever, or, you know, or over the telephone. You know, talk about his heresy, talk about his ignorance, talk about his stupidity, like he's probably not even a Christian. No, we should restore him in a spirit of meekness, considering ourselves, lest we also be tempted. I honestly believe this text is saying God's going to come for my heart. Okay? It changes from singular to plural. Okay? we got to look at the Greek. God shall give him life concerning those plural sinning not unto death now it changes to plural i can't do that with the grammar i can't take a singular life and give it to a to a plural them okay so once again i believe the grammar argues that the one that is asking is getting the life the guy sinning is already a brother he already has spiritual life but i don't believe it i'm in a judgmental state and so I pray about it, and the answer to my prayer is not the one I'm expecting to get. The answer to my prayer is that my brother has spiritual life. Okay? 
He's a brother. Now, there is a sin towards spiritual death. In the text says, I absolutely do not say that you should interrogate that. That's what the word there says. You know, somebody does not believe that Jesus Christ is God, a very God who died in their place. They, they don't believe in the substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, boy, that guy, you just can't believe. You know, there are some people committing sins that apparently the text says ought to have enough spiritual sense to understand that there's no sense talking about whether that guy's a brother in the Lord or not. He isn't. I don't think you should investigate that. And that's a different word. We can't do anything about that. You know, I would put the prodigal son in the first half of the verse. And well, I'd, I'd, put, I'd put Jezebel in the last half of the verse. I believe this text is saying you have a lot of confidence in the Lord and that you have also the confidence of your brother. And when you see him sin, you know you have enough spiritual integrity and intelligence to know that that sin is not one that leads unto death, a permanent, eternal separation from God. But it bothers you. So you pray about it, and God gives you peace. God gives life to you who are doing the praying, and you have confidence that that's a brother in the Lord. God's going to say to me, Steve, now settle down. This brother of yours has eternal life. That's what I think the text says, folks. Now, that, that may not be what it says. But I have, I have to deal with these words, same as you have to deal with them. I want you to know the comfort, folks, of, of God's grace, not a burden. If we are looking at one another the wrong way, we cannot have any peace. We cannot have any rest. We cannot have any joy. I want you to realize that Jesus Christ died in your place, that you have absolute confidence in Him. Dearly beloved, I don't think suddenly in the midst of, of all these no's that we see, in the, all these no's, all the, the knowing, 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 having confidence, having boldness, that now all of a sudden you ought to be terrified. And every sermon that I've heard on this verse is, you better be careful, man. You know, you may go to hell. You know, I don't see that in the text at all. But I'm going to look at this guy, and the Lord's going to say, Steve, he's mine. He's mine. That's what it says to me. Dearly beloved, thank you for all of your involvement in this ministry. I ask that you would continue to pray for the direction of this ministry. I hope you all are, are well. There's so many going through so many difficult circumstances and trials and hardships. Please go forth rejoicing, resting, glorying in what Christ has done for you in Christ. Praising His name. You know, if you love Him. Man, what stronger motivation could I possibly put on you folks? On you. Uh, it's stronger than love. Because you love Him, you live for Him. If you love me, guard my commandments. Not guard my commandments because you fear me. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.